Hello YouTube friends, welcome back to another video in this channel. In today's video, I'm going to be doing a walkthrough on how to use zero work for automation. So let me tell you guys what we're going to be doing today. So we're going to go ahead and do some web scraping. We're going to be acting as if we're logged into the platform and we're going to be doing a web scraping on the jobs that's available based on our criteria that we provide here. We just have some basic filters that we've set and then we're just going to grab that URL and then we're going to be grabbing some of the jobs here, such as the job title, uh, the company information, uh, maybe the salary. And then from there, we're going to be grabbing the URL where the job is so we can visit it. And then we can include additional information such as the job description. So we can write a cover letter similar to the automation that I did in my previous video when I use APFI to do web scraping in active pieces where we wrote a cover letter for the job and so we can do some automation and do, apply for that job so that's exactly what we're going to be doing today we're going to be using zero work and then i'm going to take you through the basics on how to use it i'm going to cover the difference between zero work in active pieces and tell you what the difference is between the tools just in case you're confused we're using zero work and not just use active pieces on its own so i'm just going to do a distinction between those two tools, do some basics, walk you through the zero work platform and how to build your own task bot and automation. So you can be able to scrape data. If you're not familiar with zero work, it's essentially a automation tool that allows you to do some web scraping uh, for the website majority for that reason. You can also build out your uh, data and, and since it has its built-in data table storage, you'll be able to store some data within the platform itself. And you can do some scheduling of the task as well. If you want to do some monitoring, you want to do uh, scheduling and do some automation, such as performing some browser-based tasks that you usually do on a daily basis. You can do all that within the Zero Work platform. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we're going to be doing today in this video. So first of all, let's go ahead and take a look at the agenda. I'm going to walk you through the basics. So even if you're new to zero work or if you have some basic understanding of zero work, it's probably going to be a, a video that's going to be useful for you. So I'm going to take you through the ground zero. So as I'm going to assume that you don't have any idea of what zero work is. So I'm going to take you through the basics of how to do a simple automation. Since CSS selectors is the very fundamental and key subject in terms of using an RPA tool. I'm going to do a basic tutorial on how to use CSS selector so you can be productive when you want to write your web scraping, not just for LinkedIn, but for any website that you want to do web scraping for or do automation for that matter. So I'm going to go through the basics of CSS selector. But the main thing that we're going to be doing today is we're going to be setting up a LinkedIn job web scraping. Similar to what I did in my previous video, which I did set up uh, a web scraping for, we're going to be using uh, zero work instead to do the web scraping, except that instead of using an actor, we're actually, we're going to be building the web scraping from scratch. Uh, it's going to be free aside from zero work itself, obviously, but since it's running on your own machine, you don't have to pay for any cloud fees or whatsoever. So everything's going to be free and ready to go once you do the actual automation and build it out. So that's what we're gonna be building today. We're gonna to be extracting uh, information such as the job title, the actual company information and the job uh, details. So we can do some further automation like, like how I previously did it in my previous video and write a cover letter for it if you want to. And then we're gonna be sending the, those jobs to Active Pieces. So anything that we scrape within zero work, we're gonna be sending it out to Active Pieces for further automation. So if you want to do additional automation, in addition to the job that we scrape, we can do that in active pieces. And then after that, we're going to be sending all those jobs from active pieces to a table, which is where we're going to be storing all these jobs so we can reference it. So all those things we're going to be doing in this video, hopefully you learn something new and different. And if you find any value in this video, please consider subscribing to my channel and let's start with the basics. All right. So the requirement for this is only a few things you need a Chrome browser. So that's, you're going to need that. And when you log into the zero work platform, you're going to, you're going to be presented with a screen where you have to install the zero work agent. So the task bots are saved within the zero work platform, 
but the actual automation itself runs on your local machine. So you're going to be, you're going to be needing the actual agents to be running, whether you're running it on Mac OS or Windows or Linux, they support all those platforms. So you have to just click on whatever uh, OS you have and then install the agent. And as far as other tools, the last two right here that I included is optional, but it makes the job uh, much easier because having to export the cookie and do the selector is going to make your job much easier. So let's go ahead and take a look at those two extensions. So the first one is edit this cookie. So what this one does is allows you to um, export the cookie from a website. So for instance, if I'm logged in here in uh, LinkedIn and I say myself, if I want to be able to put that in the automation context, as if I'm logged into the browser, I can export this cookie right here and I can click on this icon and then just do an export right here. So you can just see this icon on the top where it says export. You can just go ahead and click that and that would copy that cookie in, inside of the task in the clipboard that allows you to actually just take that cookie and then import that within zero work so you can include that as part of the automation so another extension that's also optional but can be helpful if you're not really too familiar with um, css selectors is this copy css selectors which is basically a tool that allows you to grab in any elements on the website and just copy the css selector for that for instance the overview right here or for any key information that you need to do web scraping for, you can just, just copy that selector automatically. But like I said, it's completely optional, uh, especially for the copy selectors, because we're going to be using developer tools today to grab the actual CSS selectors. So you don't have to worry about the extension. So that's what we're going to be doing today, this video. Hope you enjoy and sit back and let's get started. So before we uh, go ahead and do some automation, uh, let's, I want to do a comparison between zero work and active pieces. So People are probably going to ask, so I already have active pieces, so why do I need zero work for? Because it's the same uh, thinking when we use active pieces with, a with APFI. Uh, you can do some pretty robust automation with active pieces, but you can't do everything. Or you can do some automation and some web scraping to an extent, but it's not really what active pieces is designed for, at least in the meantime. Same thing with make.com and Zapier, some of the API type of automation out there. Active pieces focuses more on the business automation side, and it does a lot of the platform integration, such as if you want to transfer data between Google Drive and another platform, then this is something that Active Pieces excels at. But if you want to do some web scraping, you're going to need some tools such as AP5 or Zero Work to be able to do such as web scraping. So anything that has to do with browser based type of automation where you have to click on the screen, you have to go to a browser and visit a URL and perform some automation on a, on a browser level. You're going to need something like zero work to do that automation for you. So that's the major difference between the two platforms and why it's good to have zero work and ActiveBesys or some other RPA tools in addition to ActiveBesys, unless they introduce some web scraping in the future, which they haven't really announced anything just yet. So next thing that we're going to be covering is the basics of CSS selectors. Let's go ahead and take a look at the basics of CSS selectors, which is a pretty important subject when dealing with uh, web scraping or RPA tools, because you need to be able to uh, grab certain elements from the screen uh, using this CSS selectors. So some of the fundamental stuff, such as the elements itself, uh, if you're not too familiar with uh, HTML tags, that's not a problem. I'm going to walk you through and show you what I mean in, in a little bit. But essentially, everything on the screen has this element uh, or this HTML structure. So you have this P tag, which is semantic, it represents paragraph tags. And then you can also do a class selector, which is if someone is trying to style an element, usually they would do a CSS selector for it. And usually that's how you would select an element which has an example. For instance, this one has an example class. You would prefix it with a dot in the beginning. The ID selector is usually a stronger element because it's normally unique, but in some cases, it's probably not the best, especially for web scraping, because some of the ID selectors are dynamically generated. So you, it might not be the best one if you want a consistent web scraping automation that will produce the result consistently, if that makes sense. So the ID selector usually starts with a pound symbol and then unique would be the ID itself. 
So if you want to select an element based on an ID, you use this pound. Let's move on to the attribute selector. So if you encounter an element which has uh, an input, so you have an input type of text, uh, you have an input type of password. If you want to grab the actual element that has a particular type, this is usually not the strongest one to use because there could be multiple input type of text in the screen or trying to grab information for. The next one on the list is more specific because you're actually adding the element of it and you're actually adding the attributes and the class. So this is how you grab an element that has specific attributes. In this case, I'm grabbing anything that has a button with an ID that has a, something on it and that has an attribute of class with a button. So the more specific you, you can set your CS selective for, the better you'll be because you'll be able to target the specific element more precisely. So this is on the top is very generic because there could, could be multiple elements with this type of text. Whereas this one is unique where you're specifying the ID and something and it has the class of button, which makes it super unique. Ideally, you want something like this, just for an example. So this is how you do an attribute selector. But I'm going to be showing you guys in more details on how to use this and actually how this works. So I want to give you a high level. Descendant selector is if you want to select a span that's within a div. This is probably not ideal either because it's too generic. There could be multiple spans that is within a div. So anything that's basically a child or descendant of a div will be covered. So you probably don't want something like this, but this is just uh, an example just to show you and illustrate what a descendant selector is. A child selector would look something like this, where you're trying to grab all the li or list item within a ul as a parent. So anything that's within within the ul element, you want to directly target those elements. This is how you target those child selectors. So the selectors is a bit more complex to grasp, but they have multiple pseudo selectors that you can use in CSS. So they have this li with this colon and then first child, and then I call on last child, which is if you want to grab the first LI that matches and then the last child that matches. So you probably add additional prefix on this one so you can make the actual selector stronger and more unique. But just to illustrate what it is, this is probably something that you're probably going to be using a lot, especially if you're targeting something that's going to consist of an LI or if there's multiple items involved in it. So you want to target the actual end child. So the three here would be an index. So it's based on a zero based index. So three would be the fourth element within underneath the UL, which is an LI. So you want to target the fourth element in this case. So like I previously mentioned, to make your actual CS selector unique and stronger, there's a level of hierarchy or specificity in terms of CS selector. So the more specific you can do it, the stronger it is. So for instance, combining selectors, you can actually combine those two things. So I talked about on the top where I talked about the actual element selectors right here, where you're targeting the paragraph selector. Here on the bottom, you can actually target the actual input and then add a class. So you're targeting the input where that has the class of example in this case. The next thing here, the next example is basically a form that has a submit ID button. So which is a button. So within the actual form, element there's a form button and you can even make it stronger if you want if there's multiple forms within an actual web page which is not really very typical but you can actually add like a class here where it's something so a form that has a class of something that has a button that has an id of submit all right so the submit would be the actual and then the button would be the elements this is how you use it and this is how you put it, those different selectors together the more unique you can put this selector together the, the better it will be because you're going to be targeting the actual specific elements on the screen so let's go ahead and take a look at this example right here where you have a list of uh, jobs right here i created this uh, job criteria for a senior, senior software engineer within the united states and then i i did a search and it gave me this url on the top so let's go ahead and right click this page and do an inspect you should be able to do this and I'm using Sidekick right here, but you should be able to use this in any browser, Firefox, Chromium based browser, such as an edge, etc. So you can see here all the different HTML element. I can show you a little bit of some tricks here 
on how to capture some of the elements that you need to be able to do some web scraping for this. Right. So let's go ahead and right click where the actual job title is. Let's do an inspect on it. And let me, hopefully this is big enough. You can see it. So you can see right here where the, the inspect landed when I right clicked on it. So it, it landed in this strong. So let's go ahead and break it down. So you can see here right here, the senior software engineer is what I want to target. So if, if I do a control F on the screen and I look for an element that has strong on it, you're going to see here on the bottom right that I have like 35 result based on the strong field. So obviously strong is the actual element, but it's probably not something you want to use when you're doing web scraping because it's not specific enough. So what you want to do is you actually want to go up uh, the hierarchy and find something that's stronger that's going to make it unique so in addition to the strong you can actually add additional information such as class or what you want to include to be able to capture this so in this hierarchy you see a strong and then you have a, a span on, that's element to that and on top of the span itself there's an actual a tag which can be useful if you want to grab the actual l where the job is posted it's going to take you directly to where the job posting is so in this case, what we can grab here is the actual job title here. So looking at this class list right here, there's a disabled, there's an Ember view, and there's this container atom. So you just want to find something that's very unique that you think looks decent enough that, can, that you can use. So one thing that pops up in my head based on my experience is this one right here, the job title, which is a unique class. So let's go ahead and use that. So in, in addition to the strong, which I'm going to get rid of, this is, I'm just going to paste that, right? The job title. All right. So when we did a search for that here, you can see here that just by typing in the job card title, I'm going to add a dot on it, which basically classifies it as a class. So we're looking for a class that has a job dash card dash list underscore underscore title. And we found one out of 13 elements. So if you go through and click the down arrow on this one, just pay attention to the actual left hand side. I say click on it. You're going to see that it's going to go through all the different elements. So if I go up arrow, it's going to go through and uh, capture the actual job title itself. So to me, that's like a pretty strong selector right here where it has a class, but you can even make it stronger by adding the actual element itself in front of it. So if you do a dot job, whatever the class is, that's going to make it for a stronger selector because now you're telling it that you only want to grab a specific element. That is an A element with a class of job card dash list underscore title. And if I even want to make it even stronger, I can include an additional descendant information such as the, the span in the string, which you can. So for instance, I can make it stronger by adding it the strong right here and actually just hone down specifically to where the element is going to be, right? So underneath that, that element, I want to add a space and then a strong. And that's going to go ahead and drill it down even further. And that's going to make it even more unique, right? In the R9 situation, because it's going to grab everything down to the actual level of the service engineer. So if you go ahead and go to this one and click it again, you can see here that it's only grabbing the actual, just pay attention to the left hand side as I click on this and cycle through this. You can see here that it's selecting just those elements. I can see here that I have 13 screen. We found 13 elements. And that to me is reassuring to know that we actually have a selector that's solid enough that we can use in our automation. So that's like the basics. You can use the console and qualify your selector that way, but that's how you use and grab the information and make sure that you have a strong selector that you're going to be using for your automation. So in this case, you will want to make sure we capture the right information. So let's go ahead and walk through the zero work platform and Take a look around and get familiarized yourself with the platform where everything is. So when you first log in, you're going to be seeing this interface. You're going to see this task box on the left hand hand size where all the tasks automation that you make is going to be residing in this location. The next one is going to be the tables. So you can create tables for a specific task box, which I'm going to be covering here in a little bit. But basically tables are there to be able to hold information similar to a spreadsheet. So having this inside the actual zero work itself allows you to be able to save information within the platform. 
that you can use for other things, which I'm going to be showing you guys in a little bit. But just think of it as a spreadsheet that resides within the zero work and it's attached to a specific task box. And you can create multiple uh, table here and export and import to a CSV. You can convert it to a Google Sheet and take it from there. And then you can also duplicate it and delete it. We're going to explore a little bit how it looks like, but I just want to walk you through the actual overview of where everything is. So this is where the tables are. And then you can go ahead and go to the settings where you can download the actual desktop agent, which is required to run. So the next thing is the actual security. There's nothing in there and support you have to get support information. They have a discord community that you can go to for support, or you can email them as well. If you have some troubleshooting requirements. The next thing is where you can set up uh, ChatGPT, since they have an AI model that you can use to interact with, similar to an active pieces where you can create a prompt and send it to be ChatGPT and do some automation. You can enter your actual open AI key here and you can use the AI module for your automation. You also have an option here at the bottom where you can connect your Google Sheet, where you can send off your information and data to Google Sheet automatically. So this is also an option here that you can set up. You can include and add multiple accounts within your zero work account and then your subscription where you add. So that's it for the settings on the, on the lower right. You can see here the actual status for your running task boss. So if you have multiple task boss running, you can all see the real time information here at the bottom. You can see here some general information as to what is running and it's basically logging all that information right here at the bottom. So if you're navigating just outside of the task box itself, you're going to be seeing all that information uh, such as what's running and so forth. And then on the bottom left, you're going to see the help docs, which leads to the documentation page where you can go through and go to the cash crash course, what are selectors and how to use them, the building blocks, all the different things that we're going to be covering this video, such as chat GPT, which I just told you where to set that up and then all these different actions that you can use, which is building blocks to building your task bots. So let's go ahead and go back to zero work here. And then you can watch the video crash course, which I highly recommend. If you want to familiar yourself further after this video, you can go ahead and watch it, or maybe you already watched it and you just want to watch this video for additional information. You can do that as well. So let's go to task bots, which is the main thing here that we're going to be working with in this video. So I already have two task bots here. So here, this is what we're going to be building today. So I defined a task bots here, which i named as logged in. So this is the general flow of where we're going to be. You can see here on the left hand side, you're going to see the variables, the tables, which includes the LinkedIn jobs uh, tables. I already have one jobs table here, but you can add additional table as well. So if you want to import a table that's coming from a different task bot, you can go ahead and add an existing table from here. If you want to reuse a table that already exists somewhere else, you can do that here and just do an import. And that has some parameters here as well. So that you can feed in as part of this automation, but we're not going to do that today. We're going to be focusing on the actual tables in this automation, because that's all we're going to need. And then the general automation blocks that we're going to be using in this automation. So. You're going to see this message right here. You can collapse it and that will minimize it to the bottom screen. Let's go ahead and focus on the bottom left of the screen. You can see here your way around the actual screen. You can use your left mouse to just drag it so you can go through the different parts of the automation. If you want to go down to the bottom, it's a very smart UX design where you can just go through much easily this way. If you want to orient in a different manner, so just like this up arrow or down arrow and then like right arrow here, you can go ahead and orient it based on your preference. This looks more like a make.com type of automation, whereas this one looks like a active pieces automation. So just depending on how you want to, how you want to orient your tasks to the display. And then if you go all the way down here, if you want to go back to the middle, just go ahead and click on that center. And then plus and minus arrow here is a way to be able to zoom in in and out. And then they have a search block right here where it will search a specific block within your uh, task bus you want to go to. For instance, I want to search for open link and it's just hit enter. It's going to lead me to where it is. So if I want to go back to and do a save job title, 
is going to go ahead and focus on that specific one. This is what we're going to be building today. So in the middle is where the, obviously where you can see the actual flow. And on the right hand side, let's take a look at all of it. So similar to what we've seen earlier in the documentation, you can see all of the building blocks that you can use for within zero work. You have the ask chat GPT module here. You can drag on the screen from here. You can select which chat module you want to use, but you have to set up your key to be able to use this very similar to when you're using a block or module within Octobesis. You can click on it in the middle that will open it up from here and close it and save it. And then you can remove it from the screen if you want to. I'm going to run through all of them. You have an open link, a uh, click web link, uh, check web element, save web element, save page URL, save from clipboard. You have select a uh, web uh, dropdown if you have a, a dropdown list. Hover, web element, insert text or data. Go ahead and take a look at that one. So if we just want to add a field with some data, this is what you're going to be using. If you want to write some custom JavaScript code, this is going to be the module for it. If you want to do some typing or keyboard where you, you need, this will toggle certain, you're going to be using that keyboard element. If on the space bar, it will display right here and you can save it. So you make that keyboard action if that's what you need. Switch tab. Yeah, so one if you want to switch uh, between the different tabs, uh, you can use this one. Start condition, it's very useful if you want to do some if statements. So it has to start and set condition. We're not necessarily going to be using this in this video, but I can see that being useful for other scenarios. Start repeat, after repeat, and break repeat. The blocks that you're going to be using if you want to do a repeating loop. You have this like repeat where you, you, you can do an iteration between a collection. So those are going to be the three different modules. And then the send notification, it's like an email notification that you can send to yourself. If something happened or whatever within your automation, you can send a notification to yourself. Uh, you can upload a file, you can save a file, uh, you can update a data. Uh, so you can define here. So if you look here on the, on the, the left hand side, you can define multiple variables. So variables is basically something that can hold any value. So if you define a variable here, such as a test, you can set it to whatever value such as one, and then you can use that within your automation itself. You can reference that value or you can set the variable to something else within the automation flow. So that's what the update data is. Uh, delete data, obviously, uh, this is for deleting. So within the uh, context of data tables, if you want to delete an actual data, you can actually delete all the rows or delete one row. So this is for use within data tables. If you need to delete some data and then record date and then the send HTTP request. So similar to if you use active pieces before to be able to communicate to a different API endpoint where you'll be able to send an HTTP request, get post put patch and delete. So, and then you can add your request body here with using a JSON body and add some HTTP headers, such as authorization. If you want to do some authorization, we're actually going to be using this in this automation to send data to active pieces. So more on this in a little bit. So that's the general overview of what the different blocks are within zero work. So now that we've covered all the different building blocks within zero work, let's go ahead and take a look at what we actually want to do web scraping for. So let's go back to the screen after I entered my information, such as what type of jobs I'm looking for within the location do after I did all my filtering. Here's the different criteria or results that I get from that result. We want to scrape the job title. Obviously we want to scrape the company information. We can also scrape the compensation information, but it can be a little tricky because some of them doesn't have that information. So we're going to go ahead and skip that. But the main thing we want to scrape for is the actual job title. We want to scrape for the actual company. And then we also want to scrape the actual jobs description so we can further do some automation with it, such as write a cover letter using AI. So those are the main information that we want to scrape for. So let's go ahead and go back to zero work. They have this handy tool where you can actually drag a sticky note to the page. So you can actually write your notes here and some thoughts and what you want to scrape for or do some automation for. So we want to scrape and get the uh, job title. We want to uh, scrape and get the uh, company information and we want to scrape the description 
and obviously the URL where the job actually was posted. So we can go ahead and visit that uh, URL for further, for further, uh, you know, uh, reference. So those are the main things that we want to web scrape when we do our automation and we want to run through all the different results that we get. So first thing first is we're going to go to the actual tables here. We can add a new table. So in this case, I created a LinkedIn jobs. You can easily just do a add table here. So let's go ahead and go to an existing one. So here's what the, the tab table looks like when it's pre-filled with information. So I have the title and description, your company and then location. Unlike AI table or air table, they only have one field type, which is a string. So if you add a column here, you will add it to the beginning. So if you want to add some information such as salary information, you can do that as well. You can go ahead and type that. And there's really no column de definition. So you can set any type of data value you want to put here. It could be a number, it could be a date, it could be a URL. So it doesn't really matter. So you can add that here and then you can also go ahead and drag it and move it around if you want anywhere. If you want to order this, it's fine. And you can go ahead and delete this. We're not going to capture the seller information. I have the title here, description, a URL, and the company. To me, those are the more important data that we want to grab, right? So here's what the data table looks like. And each data table is tied to a specific task bot. So if you go back to the main menu here and I create a new task bot, it's not going to have any table here. So you want to create your own tables here from scratch. But if you want to be able to use other tables from another task bot, you can do a add table here and you can add an existing one and you can pick from an existing one that's available from a different task bot to be able to include it as part of this automation. So from here, I can add an existing one and include that LinkedIn jobs. So if you want an, if you want an easy way to just be able to reference or reuse another uh, data table from another test bot, you can go ahead and import that here and you see here that's available here now. So when you go back to the main menu, you see here that it's referencing that same table that we've created earlier. So that's how easy it is to be able to create. And you can see here that it's created a taskbot here with this and you can go here and just rename this to something else. So for instance, I want to name this to a test one. That's how I can manage my taskbot. So let's go back to an existing one that we're in. I label this as logged in because I want to be able to mimic as if I'm logged in as a user and I'm searching for a job. The way to scrape information between a logged in and a logged out user is different. So you have to make sure that you're scraping it differently because you can't use the same elements when you're scraping as a logged in user versus a logged out user. So something to keep in mind when doing a web scraping for LinkedIn. Obviously that's specific to LinkedIn. It might not work the same way when you're scraping a different website, but that's how LinkedIn works. If you go to LinkedIn right here, you see that I'm logged in. You can see here that I have the messaging here and you can tell that I can access my profile from here. So you can automate your, your job searching this way. And I found it much easier if you're logged in. In order to be able to automate while logged in, I need to be able to export my cookie so that Taskbot will have a context uh, when it starts the automation process. So when it does the automation, it actually looks like I'm logged in as a user based on my cookie. So remember earlier that I had you install this cookie. So you can go ahead and click on this edit cookie and export the cookie from LinkedIn. So you can do that by go ahead and click on this export. And now it's in the clipboard. Let's go back and go to LinkedIn right here. And once you're in link, uh, you can go ahead and click on the settings on the top and you can add the cookie information right here. So I'm going to go ahead and clear whatever I have by deleting it and add cookies right here. And I can just paste what I have on the clipboard, which basically was copied directly when I did copy it from edit this cookie. So all this information right here, such as cookie information is going to be added when I run the automation. So it's going to act as if I'm logged in as a user when it's doing the automation task. There's other settings here as well which probably not as important. You, you probably don't care at the moment, but you can run this in the background if you don't want the actual uh, browser to pop up when you run this automation. It can be handy if you want, but I find that when I'm running it in Playwright, I find some issues when running it in the background. So you probably want to keep this off. 
stay on page after one, they recommend to leave this disabled or unchecked. Run in non-incognito. So run incognito is the opposite of incognito. So usually when you run an automation, it usually runs in incognito mode. So essentially when you run an automation, it's usually running its own session. Since we're plugging in the cookies, we're basically setting it to be authenticated in this case. So when you check on run non-incognito, it's gonna get rid of that option to be able to set it as a logged in user. So you wanna disable this as well. If you just wanna have the actual automation type, all your credentials and so on and so forth, you can do that. But if you want to preset the cookies ahead of time, you wanna leave this unchecked. So that's some information here, some user agents, if you wanna add proxying here, if you wanna enter in some separate IP, if you have a different website for proxying, you can add that here as well. That's for a more advanced scenario. You're masking your IP. So that's a, a separate discussion on its own, but we're not going to cover in this video. But those are the taskbot settings. So I went ahead and copied that cookies right here and we can go ahead and close that. So every time I run this automation now, it's going to have that cookie information embedded as far as this uh, taskbot. So when I run this, it's going to be acting as if I'm logged in in LinkedIn. All right. So the general flow of the task the taskbot itself, after I added the data table, is it's gonna open up the link. It's gonna start a repeat. It's gonna go to a loop and it's gonna go through all the different, it's gonna grab the job title, it's gonna grab the URL, the save, save the company information. And then after the fact, we're gonna go ahead and grab the actual description using the after repeat. And then we're gonna go ahead and do a start repeat here once again and open link. Don't worry about the specifics for now. I just want to do a general overview of what everything is. I apologize in advance if it's a little bit confusing. I'll try to do another video if if it helps, but I'm just going to try my best to explain these concepts uh, as best I could. But in the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and just do a general overview of what the actual taskbot entails. All right, so it's going to open up a link. And it's going to go through and navigate to the actual URL that we captured from the previous step when we did the repeat. And then we're going to go ahead and click on this to see more and then save description. So that's the, the high level of the actual automation. Let's go ahead and put it in perspective. So let's go back to the actual LinkedIn here. So what it's doing here is it's going to grab all the different links here, such as the senior software engineer, all the different iteration or item such as each position, right? You're going to go to the next one. You have the second item in this list and the third one and so on and so forth. Since it requires having to click on each one to be able to grab the description, we're not going to go that route. We're just going to go ahead and capture the URL here. And then we're going to do a second run and pre-fill the description information on the second run. So the first run is going to be primarily everything that you see here, such as the job position the company information and the URL to the job. So that's the title, the URL and the company. So those, those are the main information that we're going to be grabbing from the first run. And like I said, we're going to be iterating to all these different jobs. So that's the main part of this first iteration. So if, if I flip back in zero work, you can see here that if I hold shift, if I hold my shift key here, it changes to this icon instead of, instead of hand, it has this pointy icon. So it allows me to be able to like grab and select multiple ones, right? And then one of, that's one of the shortcuts that you can use in zero work. But anyways, besides the point, what I'm explaining here is basically, so this is my first pass, which is going through the jobs. And then they have this block where you can do additional automation after you've done the iteration after the loop. So this is the second loop. So the first pass is basically going through the steps. So pay attention to the, the left hand side right here. It's confusing. You can let's go ahead and disable this so you can de let me deactivate this one so you can see the flow here. I know it's confusing how it all having these little nested blocks here, but so it starts with opening the URL where we have set the actual parameters for the job search. And then it's going to go through and grab all the different job titles using this selector. And it's going to, depending on how many selectors we get on the screen is basically how many iteration we're going to do. So focusing on the only the left hand side of the actual automation. So we're going to go ahead and grab the actual job title using this selector. 
they have this special selector here where you have this two greater than and then nth loop, which basically says that within this iteration, we're going to grab the first loop item. So this is a selector to grab the title and then this double greater than and then nth of loop index is zero. I'm going to be leaving this code in the board mix that you can reference to, but we're saving the text information. So if you can come here, you can actually grab the actual link as well. If you want to grab the URL from an element, or you can grab some additional information such as the HTML. If you want to grab the image information, you can do that as well. But we're going to stick with text since we want to grab the actual text information from the job title. And we want to save this inside of the actual data table. So from here, if you want to set this to a variable, you can select a variable here. Since we created a data table to host multiple records, we're going to be using the LinkedIn jobs data table. And then we're going to be saving it within the actual job title since we have that already. And then you can see here at the bottom, you can see the minimum seconds and the maximum seconds. This is the amount of time that we want to delay before you can proceed to the next step or next block in this flow. All right. It's important. So if I do my scroll on the mouse, you can see here that I'm zooming in. So it's important that you want to name your block specific to what you're doing so you don't get lost in the process. So it's very important to do that right away when you create the block and add it. So similar to the job title, we also want to save the URL. So we're going to go ahead and use the same CSS selector here instead of the text. So if we go to the next one, we are actually grabbing the link. So it's similar selector, but we're actually grabbing the link because we want to grab the URL for that job itself so that we can visit that later and grab the description. So that's what we're going to be setting it to. We're setting it to a minimum of seconds because everything is instant. Everything is display displayed on the screen. So we don't need to add any more delay on the, on the actual automation or this particular block. So the next thing is for the actual company information. So I have the selector here for the actual card or for the company information. So if you go back here to, to the list here, you can see here, I have the exact science, I have the first American. So this is the same company. If you right click on this one and do an inspect, the actual inspector is going to lead you straight to where the, the element is on the screen. So if you go here and if you click on this one, it's going to lead you straight to that one. So I grab this element right here, which is the job description or the job yeah, description. And you can go ahead and ex expand on this one. You see here that I'm grabbing the actual Morgan Stanley. So if I go back to my automation real quick and grab the actual CSS selector. So I can go ahead and do a find on that one, control F and then paste it. So you can see here, it did find one out of 13. So if I do scroll down, you can see here that every time as I navigate to this one, if I click on the downward arrow, it's going to go ahead and go to the next one and so on and so forth. If I go up, it's going to go and toggle back and forth. So that's the, my way of being able to navigate and get through the element. So in this case, that's my way of grabbing the company information. So that's the selector. And then I'm adding the special syntax, which basically appends to the actual selector that, okay, double greater nth selector. I'm going to grab this, whatever element is part of the actual iteration. So if in my first pass, I'm grabbing the first element, the second pass, I'm getting the second element and so on and so forth until I go through all the lists that it found on the page and I'm saving the text element. And in this case, I'm saving that information into the company information. All right. So that's the first pass. So what do you do after that? Once we have all the different, um, LinkedIn jobs. So I've saved the title, the URL on the company information. Now I want to get the description right for each jobs. What I want to do is I want to navigate to each of these URLs. So if we click on one of these URL, if you actually click on it, it's going to go ahead and go through and navigate to that URL. You can see here that there's about the job here where you can actually see the actual description for the job. But before you actually see the job description, you have to click on the see more to be able to see and expand that. So that's what we're going to be doing as part of the, the second iteration. So we're going to go after we capture the, the base information, such as the URL, uh, the job title and the company information, we're going to go ahead and grab uh, the description for each of those uh, jobs that we found. So let's go back to zero work. So once we capture this one, this is going to be blank, the description. Let's go ahead and activate. So let's go ahead and zoom out. And I want to go ahead and shift and then drag my left mouse 
and then I'm going to go right click and activate. So that so we're going to be focusing on the the right hand side. So after the loop here, after we finish all the loop on the left hand side, we added this module which says after repeat. This is a block that you can use after the repeat process has been completed. So if you have 10 jobs that you've iterated through after that 10th ten, ten job has finished, you want to do additional automation on top of it. So this could be its own task bot, but you can also do something like this where you can combining multiple tasks into one by adding this after repeat. So let me go ahead and deactivate this real quick so you can focus on the, on the right hand side of the actual automation. So after the left hand side completed, it's going to go ahead and tackle this one. So after repeat is a block that just starts a new, new set of actions after uh, the repeat has happened. The next time we added was we added a start repeat here and instead of making a standard like we had it in the previous one, we're doing a dynamic here because we actually want to iterate over the tables that we captured from the first repeat, which is the LinkedIn jobs. So once we stored the basic information, we want to go ahead and loop through all the information. You can also do a reverse here, which is not necessary, but you can also li limit here as well if you just want to want to run through a certain amount of you know records and do certain actions for those ones you want to limit it here or you can just leave it um, blank so that it will go through all the different records in that table so that's the start repeat so let me go ahead and drag this on the visualize this a little bit better so you were now within a second loop here so within the context of the second repeat what we're doing here is basically we're going to be opening a link so from here, let's make, let me go ahead and add this open link module. When you're first you're going to see this, something like this, right? Where you can actually add your URL. In this case, we want to go through and grab the actual URL from the data that we scraped from earlier. So right now we are in the context of data table. We're iterating over the data table records. So now we want to grab uh, the record uh, information. You can copy the variable reference. You can see here on the top right of this dialog do some copy primary reference or you can actually copy table reference which we're, we're going to be using so we're going to be clicking on this one and we're going to be clicking on the LinkedIn jobs and then from here I can insert anything that I want to be able to prefill that information for so in this case we're going to be using the URL that we grab from the data table we're going to be grabbing the URL and that's the ID it has this funky syntax but it's going to grab through and grab the URL from this one and it's going to open that link so if you go here, it's going to go through each one and it's going to grab the URL for the first one and then the second one and so on and so forth. After that, it's going to go ahead and click on to see more. So if you go back to the actual job itself, you can see here that we should refresh this, this page right here. You can see here that before you actually see the description, you have to click on the see more button right here in the middle. So basically, if you do an inspect on it, if you go ahead and right click and inspect, it's an actual button. You see here that it has this area, that label of click to see more. And that's the actual CSS selector that, I, that I've used for the automation. So I want to be able to expand on this one and click on it before now I can grab all the information that we see here about the description itself, right? So once I have it that, I click on it, which I'm using here. So I'm using a button of this property of area dash label equals to this click to see more description. And then I'm going to add a little bit of delay here so I, you can see the interaction on the screen. So I added a minimum seconds in delay between between the next this one and the next one. And then from here, you can see here that I'm just grabbing the description. So this is where the CS selector can be useful for. So if you go back to that screen, you can see here if I right click this one and I do a copy CSS selector, you can see here that a small animation happens between when I click on copy select CS selector here. So when I copy, go ahead and copy CS selector on the screen, you can see here that it has this like highlighting that happens around the element. So, I mean, we can go ahead and copy this as well and just find out where exactly this one falls. I can go ahead and copy the job description. I know that this is the class right here that I can grab and then I can go back to MT4 and that becomes my selector. Or I can just go ahead and just right click it and just copy CSS selector for whatever element I want to grab. So. If I want to grab the whole, I want to grab and copy from probably up here, so you can see here. And then if I do a control F for that, it will lead me straight to 
where that actual text is for the job description. So that's what I'm using here for uh, this, the last one, or I'm just setting here, whatever I got from that copy CS selector. Because I just want to try it out, how good it is. So it works. And you can save the text information. And then from here, since we are in iteration, so we're going to go ahead and update the description column and we're going to go ahead and save it. So that's the automation itself. One thing that you can also do is send it to Activis, right? But before we do that, let's go ahead and run this. I'm going to go ahead and delete the data so we can start from the beginning and can see how it works. So I'm going to go ahead and delete the data. And then I'm going to go ahead and reactivate some of these, these steps right here. And then from here, I can just hit play. And then you're going to be seeing, I don't know if you can see my screen, but the Chrome browser opened up and then it now is going through each of the actual job profiles. Now it's going through all the different jobs that was found. There's a little bit of delay, so it's going to take a little bit of time, but it's running it right now. And I don't think it's adding it here yet, but soon enough, we're going to be notified that it's running successfully. We're starting repeat. Right now it's going through each jobs. Nothing here yet. So let's go ahead and wait till it finishes. We can see our status on the top or at the bottom uh, right here. You see the running task bots. You can see the real time information as to what's happening. It's clicking on the element, saving the job description. So right now it's in the saving the job description step right here. It's going through each one. Start repeat. All right. So once it's done, it says right here, your task bot ran successfully, which shows up on the lower left hand of the screen. And you can go back to LinkedIn jobs. And now we have all the information except for the location, which we didn't really do in this automation anyways. But we have the job title, the job script, who are we? And now we can use that to write some cover letter like we did with the Indeed automation. And then we also have the link to actual the job itself. So if we click one of these, it actually leads you to where the actual job posting. So you can further do some automation as, as well if you want to grab additional information, such as how many employees and so on and so forth, who's hiring all that information that you need to do this automation. All right, let's go ahead and talk about how to send the jobs to ActiveVisys itself. So if you can recall from my previous video, I created this job search table in a table where I have this uh, job search where I put all the job information, such as the job title, information, the title, company, salary, and URL to the cover letter and so on and so forth. The only change that I made was basically to add the source here so I can determine uh, where the job posting was coming from, whether it's Indeed or LinkedIn. So that's the only change that I made on the AA table side. And on the pizza side, I added a new flow here. I call it zero work LinkedIn jobs, where I basically have a catch webhook as the actually the trigger this automation. And then it created a URL for me. I don't have any authentication just to keep it simple. But basically, it accepts a JSON payload, which has the URL title, company, and the description. And then from here, I can create a record in any table and insert that information. So create a record, and then I'm choosing the job search data sheet. And then I'm pre-filling the, uh, the table information, such as the title, company, and then the salary, and then description, the job URL. And then lastly, I put a LinkedIn so I know it's coming from LinkedIn. So that's the only thing from the active pieces side. So let's go ahead and go back to zero work to finish this off. So from here, I added a send HTTP request. Let's go ahead and start from the beginning so you can see what, what's happening. So from here at the end of the second repeat here, I have the first repeat, which goes through and grabs the title, the main information. And then I have a second repeat, which basically grabs the description. And then from here, we can go ahead and, and send this information to active pieces. So it's doing it right at the point where we're going through each of these records. And as we fill this description information, we're actually sending in this information to active pieces after, after we get the, the description information. So that's going to be the tail end of this, the second repeat that we have here. So the, the last step that we have to add here is to send HTTP a block, which we need to add to the bottom. So let's go back to the active basis and copy the, the webhook test URL where I can copy here and go back to a zero work. And let's go ahead and paste it here, request URL. 
and remove the extra space. And then we're gonna have to switch this to a post instead of a get. So we can paste in and send in the actual payload for the request. Next thing that we have to do is actually grab the payload that we, we're gonna be using to send this request. I already have it pre-filled right here. So we're gonna have the title, company description, and then the URL. We're just gonna remove the salary since we don't, we're not really scraping that information. But mainly we're gonna be sending out the title, company description, and the URL as part of the, the request body. We're not sending any headers information since we're not really authenticating anything. But if you do, then you have to put this information here, such as your authorization headers. From here, we're going to pre-fill the title by going up to the top right where it says copy type table reference. So within the uh, confine of the actual uh, loop or repeat, we can select the actual columns within the table. So right here, I can set the title. And then from here, I can set the uh, company information by picking the company information here, description. I can go ahead and set description. And then from here, I can set the URL. All right, I can go ahead and save it. And then from here, I can just connect it from the previous step after we set this description. All right, so the way to test this in isolation is you can deactivate the previous repeat step here, which you can do by clicking on shift and then highlighting the previous step before the start repeat happens and you can go ahead and right click and deactivate. So that's actually run this in isolation and run this side of the automation without having to run the whole thing. So that's the, the first option that you have. Another option that you have is you can actually refactor this and move this to another task bot. So you can do that by going ahead and go back to main menu and let's go ahead and do a task bot here, which we just created just for demonstration. We're just gonna go ahead and name this to send to active pieces. And this is gonna be a completely empty task bot that we just created just so we can copy over and isolate just for running the second repeat. So it's gonna go back to main and we're gonna go back into the actual main uh, task here. So the second option that we have is we're gonna go ahead, let's go ahead and copy this by shift and then uh, left clipping, left clicking. And then we're gonna go ahead and copy to another task bot here, right? So since we created sent to AP, we're gonna go ahead and copy there. And then we have an option basically just to open up that new taskbot from here. So now we have the taskbot information. We also have to go back to the previous taskbot. Oh, not hit this one, but we have to go back here and also copy the, the cookie information that we set earlier in the beginning, since we want to keep it uh, the same context when we do run that isolation automation. So we'll go back to the, the new automation or new taskbot here and click on the settings on the top right and set the cookies. And let's go ahead and close this one and that's going to successfully save it. The only thing that we're missing here is it doesn't carry over the, the tables. So we're going to go ahead and add a table here. But instead of adding a new table, we're going to go ahead and add an existing table. So we're going to be reusing the existing uh, LinkedIn jobs that we have. Keep in mind here that there's an actual ID that's set for each one so that we can reference it later. I'll tell you a little bit why we need that. but. Because there's going to be an issue when we run this. So what we're doing right now is going to, we're basically going to run through the steps that we had on the previous task bot, and we're going to run it through the LinkedIn jobs here. So instead of having to link, go through each one, we're just going to go ahead and do a repeat once. And then we have to make sure that we're sending it to the actual correct location. Let's go back to active pieces and let's do a retest here. So we want to make sure that no, we're actually sending the job properly. All right, let's go ahead and run this. You see here that it's actually gonna run the same way, but it's only gonna run once. And it's grab, gonna grab the job description. So you notice here there's an error at the bottom. So there's an error when it's actually sending this information to active pieces because of some characters in the description when it, it, it runs a json.parse. And we can go ahead and look over the logs here. If you go to the top right here, you can see the reports of the runs. You can see the warning, and then you can see the view error details. So it can give you the screenshot and then it gives you some parsing error information here. And it doesn't really tell you a whole lot, but it says right here, send HTTP request. That's when the, the error is. It's confusing because it gives you this screenshot information, which doesn't really pertains or it's not related to the actual issue itself. But it says right here that something's wrong when we send this JSON and it's, and it's giving us this send HTTP request. So that's the extent of the details that we get. But after some digging, I realized that the actual error stems from the fact that it's sending some characters from one of the jobs that we get. 
and it has some valid, invalid characters as part of it. One thing that I have to add is basically add a intermediate step here. I have to go back and add a code piece, which you can do if you're running out of options. So basically I'm adding here a code piece where I'm going to go ahead and copy this one. I'm going to break it down so I can show you how it works. We're going to go ahead and copy it. We're going to go ahead and add the actual JavaScript here. And then we're just going to paste it. So here's the documentation itself. You want to review the documentation right here in the top. But essentially I declared a function that basically removes certain characters from throwing off the, uh, the actual uh, JSON parsing. So I declared a function. I'm not doing anything with the function yet. But what I'm doing here on the bottom is I'm declaring a, a job description, which I'm referencing the job description data table. So remember earlier to keep in mind what the actual reference ID is right here. You can see here what I'm highlighting right here. So basically this references the actual data table within a zero work. So when you open this up, you can actually get information and reference that data table. And from here, I'm referencing ID of this data table. Specifically, I'm referencing the column within that data table and I'm assigning it to job description. So what I'm doing here is I'm just cleaning and I'm calling this function. I'm passing in the job description and then I'm cleansing it as part of this step and reassigning it back to this job description. Hence the let, not the cons. So I'm overriding the previous one. And then on the last uh, piece of code right here, I'm using the same thing. I'm referencing that ID and then that description. But instead of get ref, which I have right here, I'm doing a set ref here. Both are using the weight, right? Because they're both async. And then I'm setting the new value as the new job, job description. So essentially what it's doing is I'm grabbing the job, saving the description, and I'm also cleaning it up and then shoving it back in, in the actual data table. So what we're going to do is we're going to, after we get the description, we're going to go ahead and clean up the description and we're going to move it right in between it. So right when we get the description, we're going to go ahead and grab the description and then um, clean it. And then we're going to go ahead and call and send it to active pieces. So right now active pieces is still waiting to be called. So right now let's go ahead and uh, test this step. I want to make sure that I'm only running it once so you can see here. I'm only running once and let's go ahead and run it. So it's going to go to the same step. It's going to open up the Chrome browser. And if, after a few seconds, you can see here that it ran successfully. Go back to active pieces. You can see here that the actual job was uh, called. It was run with this URL title company and the description. And we have that information here. Now we can insert it to a table and go ahead and retest this and it should work. And if you go back to a table, you should have a new entry here with a grouping of LinkedIn. Since I did a grouping of LinkedIn and Indeed, so now I have the record right here. So now you can do additional information on top of this. So that's it for this video. If you like this type of video, please go ahead and hit subscribe and do like this video. If I provided any value, let me know in the comment if you want any specific video you want me to do a video on and I'll see you next time.